From the Toronto Star, I'm Rudy Mudder, and this matters. We've all seen how quick and easy it is in movies and on TV for someone to hotwire a car. Of course, everything about it is complete fiction. Modern day cars have computers that make it impossible to rip out wires, rub them together, and make a car start. That said, these days, with the right tools, those computers help make it so thieves can just as quickly and easily steal a vehicle. Just as cars have become much more sophisticated, so have car thieves in terms of the technology they use and the organization required to move the car after it's been taken. Just last week, York Region Police detailed how some thieves were using Apple AirTag trackers to target cars so they could steal them later. Kevin Donovan is the chief investigative reporter at the Star. He joins us today to talk about a recent look he did into auto theft. Kevin, thanks so much for coming back onto the show. Great to be here, Raju. Okay, Kevin, this story is very interesting because there's a very personal start to it for you. Can you tell us how inspiration struck? Yes, I went out to look for my car and it wasn't there. I always lease a car. I tend to lease Toyotas、uh, have for 15 years, and it was just gone one day. And I have a tracking app on the car, which just comes with the car, and it showed that it had been moved up the street at 3:02 a.m. I Of course, went up there in my wife's car, and it wasn't there. And so the hunt began. Where is Kevin's Toyota? <laughs> okay, Kevin. Just to be clear, what kind of car was it? It's a Toyota Highlander. It was a 2021. I use it for all sorts of things. You know, moving family. It's an SUV. You know, moving lumber sometimes. My various projects. When I was a soccer coach, I would use it to move balls and other things needed for coaching around. It's an everyday vehicle. It's a nice vehicle, and unfortunately, it's one of the most stolen vehicles in Canada right now. You've done a deep dive into car theft. I'm sure if the thieves knew as you, they'd probably leave the car alone because they probably don't want their secrets all told. But <laughs> what did you find out about how the thieves stole it? Yeah, so I mean, I called the police as you're supposed to, and the detective was great. But they don't come to your house anymore. They just take it over the phone. Dealing with insurance, and you know, I was not a fan of how that insurance. Seem to know nothing about the concept of auto theft. It was a shock to them, which is crazy when we've got seventy-five thousand cars a year stolen in Canada, which is not an insignificant number. But in talking to police and some of the brighter lights in the insurance industry, they said they probably use something called a relay. Relay is a device that thieves use to pick up the signal from an electronic key fob. You know, when we were growing up, we all had just a key that inserted into the ignition. Many cars these days have a key fob. The key fob is always emitting a little electronic signal, and we keep ours in the center of the house. At the time, we didn't put them in a box or anything. We do now, and the thieves are able to pick up the electronic signature of the key fob, relay it, amplify it, and then they touch the side of the door. The door pops open. The second thing they do, and it's not exclusive to Toyotas, but in my case, they would have used a device that causes the car to think you're talking to the engine, to the ignition. And they basically would have brought two blank key fobs, and when I'm saying key fobs, we're talking about just a little thing we push open, close, stuff like that. They reprogram them, and then within a few minutes, they were backing out of the driveway. The car thinks you know its owner is driving it, and they've gone up the street to a little park. Okay, now you already mentioned that you tracked them. How did they disable that? Yeah, so I got quite excited when I looked at the app, and it said that at 3:02 a.m. the car had moved. It had gone a kilometer and a half away, and you know, it's basically almost like looking at a Google tracking trace. I could see the park. I know I often ride my bike around there, so I go up there, and there's no car there. So what they would have done is disabled the GPS and whatever tracking a car like a Toyota would have in it. I know that they took the small antenna in the car that was removed, and then they do something, and I don't know what they did to the device under the dashboard, but they disabled that, removed it. It's gone. Okay, so I kind of want to jump to what happens next, but I don't think we can without sort of establishing. First off, everyone told you you're never going to see your car again, right? Yeah, and, and in fact, just you know, not a couple of days ago, I realized that my plates. You know, I had to make sure that they had been reported stolen, and I always get a two-year plate, and so there's hundred bucks or whatever left on the sticker, and so I went in 
And as I went into the service Ontario, I went in and the woman there said, as I left and I got my money back, she said, well, I hope you get your car back. And I just said, I don't think you get cars back like this. I think that it's gone somewhere. And that's what I was told. Right. So basically everyone said, there's no way you're getting back. But then one day you get a call and they found your car. Tell us where it was. Yeah. I don't know if my jaw has ever dropped, like somebody would describe in a detective novel, but my jaw dropped. The police called. I answered the phone and the detective said, Mr. Donovan, they found your car. (laughs) I started laughing. I said, is this a joke? She said, no, we found your car. It's in Halifax. It was on its way to the Middle East. Now that we got to the end of that story, you've done a lot of research. How did it get there? Yeah, so I've talked to police, insurance people, and some other people with knowledge of this, who I'm not going to identify right now by their profession. What I understand is, so the car comes out of the driveway, goes up, and it would have stopped at this parkette, which I think is a bit of a staging area. There's probably a lot in various neighborhoods in the GTA. A new crew would have come in. The other crew, they're just in charge of stealing the car. They've got other job to do. It's three o'clock in the morning, probably going to get a couple more cars. Then we have the new crew comes in. They take it to another staging area and literally drive the car into a 40-foot container. And I know that another car, almost identical Toyota, was driven into the container as well. Containers closed. A truck comes and picks up this big 40-foot long container and takes it to one of two railway shipping yards in Toronto area, either one in Brampton or one up in Concord. And at that stage, I don't think there's any criminal involvement. I think it's just somebody who gets an order. You got to pick up a container and this happens all the time. Then it's put on a CN rail train and it goes east. And in fact, within 36 hours, that car is in the port of Halifax in a container with, as it turns out, 14 other containers in total 30 vehicles. And those vehicles are sitting there and then customs officers, I mean, there are thousands of containers that pass through every year, and they obviously cannot check them all. For a reason I don't know, they check these containers, open them up, and the first thing they noticed was, here are these cars that are two cars, two Toyotas that are headed to Dubai. They've got Ontario license plates on them, which I thought was kind of dumb of the thieves. I would take the plates off. The plates are there, and they check the Canadian police information computer called CPIC, and they find that these cars are reported stolen. And then it would take some time, but they eventually alert the Toronto police. Toronto police talked to me. And, you know, my first question was, is my stuff in there? Because I had some old golf clubs. I had some tie-down straps. I just bought a friend, a tool, an orbital sander. That's all gone. And my Werther's, because I have a bit of a sweet tooth occasionally when I'm working on assignments. And the Werther's are gone. Two bags of bread flour that I bought. So that stuff's all gone. But the car's in great shape. Minor scuff on the front because it bumped into the other car when it was being moved around. I mean, these are two vehicles that are about 16, 17 feet long. And they're put inside there with straps to hold them because they're going on a huge ocean voyage. And these container ships are so huge, they can hold a thousand of these 40 foot long containers. So Kevin, they seized 30 cars there. How much was that in terms of estimated value? I mean, there were some Porsches there, some nicer vehicles, some Ford 150 pickup trucks, but big ones fully loaded, probably about $1.5, $1.8 million. The police in various jurisdictions have made some busts in the last year, and it seems to be between $2 million and $5 million of vehicles are recovered at a time. My sources say that, you know, good for the customs people, what they did that day. But in those other thousands of containers that are going to be heading overseas, there are lots of cars that are gone. I mean, 75,000 are stolen every year in Canada. They're going somewhere. Kevin, this is great. I want to pack a whole bunch of stuff in here. First off, what do you think about the sophistication of these sort of modern day car thieves? I mean, you tell me about stealing the car. I'm thinking about hot wiring it. Yeah. And a lot of the people I talked to in law enforcement, they all seem to have seen a movie called Gone in 60 Seconds. That was with Nicolas Cage. It's a Jerry Bruckheimer movie. The trailer is fantastic. And then they're doing it in 60 seconds. These thieves are pretty sophisticated, but a lot of these devices that they're using, you can buy them and maybe on the dark web, maybe you can also get them just from some companies out there that are selling these as if they're diagnostic tools. The devices they're using Cars are so sophisticated these days. They're not like the 1969 Pontiac, and I could take that thing apart and put it together. I couldn't touch any of these cars today. There's you know, 2,000 semiconductor chips inside of these vehicles. They're computers. And so I think the people who are doing it, 
are probably pretty savvy, probably pretty young, I would say. And, you know, it's the sort of thing that you think of the old saying, if they could put their brain power to good. The other thing I've learned is that they don't want to spend a lot of time in your driveway. They want to get in and get out quickly. And so if you can do anything to stop them from taking your car, that's going to make them, unfortunately, go to the next driveway. So, yeah, they're smart cookies, the ones who are doing this. We'll be right back. Let's talk about some of the cars. What are they after? What are the brands that are sort of sought after? Yeah, the Insurance Bureau of Canada publishes a list every year. And I've looked back, obviously, last year, and the new list is coming out in December. There's a particular interest in Honda vehicles and Toyota, and both Toyota and Honda have a higher-end vehicle. SUV is very, very popular. In fact, I would say that they're the most popular in SUV. These are vehicles that have a lot of you know different uses, and I guess the thieves want them. Ford 150 pickup trucks, also very common. And, you know, there was a Porsche taken in the group that mine was part of. That's not as common, but certainly those higher end cars are taken as well. Okay. Now you believe they were headed to the Mideast. Any reason that part specifically? And then also just what's driving the overall demand? Yeah. The investigators I talked to say that a couple of years ago, cars were leaving from say the Montreal port or the Halifax port, and they were going to West Africa and then they would be driven or moved up into Europe. Now in the last 12 months, it's changed. And the fact that mine was going to Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, and I'm not saying that that's where it ultimately was going to be, but that's one of the big ports there. It seems that the Middle East is very popular now. And Interpol says on its website that they're finding that the theft of cars is a big part of organized crime and a big part of terrorism. There's concern that the sale of these cars to fund terrorism, there is you know, some concern that some of these vehicles might be used as something as drastic as a suicide bombing. The, the cars that are stolen the cars and trucks were probably valued in Canada between, say, forty and fifty thousand dollars. My understanding is that they're sold for two and quite often three times as high right now, and that's because of this worldwide disruption in the supply chain. Semiconductor chips don't ask me to explain them, but they're computer chips. And a car like my Toyota has two thousand in them. They operate everything: your backup camera, your power steering wheel, all these fancy devices that we have. And there's a disruption in the supply chain. There's not as many cars available, and so people in, let's say, Middle East or Europe who want a decent car, they can't buy one legitimately. All of a sudden, they become available through theft. You make a point that the insurance companies just didn't seem to care. And everyone says, you're never going to get this back. I mean, what do you think sort of about this blase attitude that you got about this crime? Yeah, that's a good question. On this sort of the ground level, you know, when your car is stolen, hopefully nobody's car will be stolen listening to this. But if it is stolen, you're going to deal with your broker and then you're going to deal with somebody called an adjuster at your insurance company. And the adjuster's job is to make a payout. And those people just did not seem aware that car theft was a big issue. And I mean, there's so many worse crimes out there, obviously, but I didn't feel any sense that this was a big deal at all. And I would say to them, what should I do? Like, I don't want this to happen again. And they said, I don't think there's anything you can do. And it turns out there are things you can do. And I've learned that from the police and from insurance companies have investigators. And those people are all over this issue. But it's the ground level people that you'll deal with if your car is stolen. They seem to not have a clue. Their only thing was you should get a camera. Well, I actually now have a camera, but I've seen the camera footage online of cars being stolen. And basically all you get to do is walk some drive away. Like they're wearing a hood, you know, they don't have a sign on the back of their shirt, Bill, the car stealer. So, but I got a camera and a few other gadgets. Okay. This is the service journalism part of here. What should people be doing? And Kevin, I read your story. I'm already doing it. What are the things that people should be buying? Well, it's not that expensive. Here's what I've learned. In the 1800s, there's a guy named Michael Faraday who was an electronic engineer. And not only was he working with electromagnetism, he also figured out we got to have a way to shield electromagnetism. So enter what's called the Faraday pouch. I have four of them now, and I've already given some away as gifts. It's 20 bucks to purchase four of them. And it's a pouch that you put your fob inside and it shields it. So if you're listening to this and you have a key fob and you walk up to your car, normally your car door, you can get it open and start your car, put it in the pouch. It's as if you do not have a key fob. So what I do now is I have a Faraday pouch. We all put our keys inside it. 
they go in the center of the house. Secondly, it's old school technology, but there are various versions of what is called a club. The club is a device that's about just under a meter long and it's expandable. You hook it onto your steering wheel. It's made of pretty unbreakable stuff and you put it on very visibly so that you could not turn your car wheel more than say a quarter or a third of a turn. Now you can defeat that for sure, but you can defeat it by cutting the steering wheel. So if your job is to steal a car, a nice car and get it over to the Middle East, you're also going to have to get another steering wheel because you're going to rip the steering wheel apart. So the notion is that you're going to stop them from acquiring the signal. If there's some other way they get into your car and try and do some other funny business, then they're going to see the club. Well, I'm not going to bother with this one. And then the other thing is not everybody in Toronto has a garage, park your car in a garage, park it in a welded area. And if possible, and this is our, what we call our gate, we have an older vehicle in the family and we park that as the, I call it putting the gate across at night. (laughs) I think you've already said this, 75,000 cars across Canada. I think you said 25,000 in Ontario. I think five or 6,000, almost 6,000 in the Toronto area, but Toronto Police, there isn't really an auto theft squad. You said there were a few busts. I mean, do you think that more could be done in terms of actual enforcement from the authorities? Yeah, I think so. And I think the importance of this is that if Interpol and other authorities are correct, that this is part of the organized crime web, then it's something we should take seriously. And also cars being stolen cause everybody's insurance rates to increase 13 to 15% in Toronto apparently is put on because of car thefts. That's a lot. That's for all of them. And so, yeah, the Toronto Auto Squad was disbanded years ago. Old time coppers that I know grumble about that. Peel has an auto theft squad. York does. They've recently had some pretty significant busts. Toronto hasn't. I know the Toronto police is always saying that they're under resourced. Not entirely sure how true that is, but I think there would be some officers that would be very interested in having a specialized squad. Kevin, this is fantastic for us. Is there anything I didn't ask that you think our listeners should know? Well, I think one issue is just don't leave anything of value in in your car. Certainly no personal papers. Don't leave your passport or your driver's license. Don't bring home work and say you're going to do it in the morning and then leave it there and then it's gone. Photographs, anything personal, don't leave it there. I mean, the stuff I left, it's okay that it's gone. Don't leave your sunglasses, you know, and obviously lock your car doors, which is amazing that people don't do that. So yeah, just be smart about things. And what I found, because I do try and bring everything in from the car after I come in off an interview on the road, it makes your car look cleaner. What are you driving now? So it was a lease and it's insurance. So I've got a very similar car back now which I've got all the bells and whistles protecting it. And I hope to have it when the lease is up. (laughs) Well, Kevin, I hope no one takes it either. Thank you so much for your time and knowledge today. Thanks, Reggie. Kevin Donovan is the chief investigative reporter at The Star. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm your host, Raju Mudder. Our This Matters team is Adrian Chung, Brian Bradley, JP Fozo, Matt Hearn, Morgan Bockneck, Saba Etizaz, and Sean Pattenden. Our music is by so-called Mike DeAngelis and Sean Pattenden. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com slash subscribing matters. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. <laughs>